Stop the retreat crossing because remember Midian is going further east. Thank you so much. And he wins the war. Not only does he win the war, but entities of the Jewish people on the east side of the Jordan that he asks for food, supplies. Okay? Gidon doesn't have, what do they call those meals that the army has in store? What are they called? MREs. MREs, whatever. We were together at a bar mitzvah with our family, our grandson is Pesh Abbas, so I saw my son that was in the, uh, the, uh, the exercise in Cyprus. I said, probably had good cooked meals. He says, no, we had the, that's what they ate. <laughs> right there. That's all they... I heard this kosher food But we took a 5,000 soldiers, I don't know how many thousands of soldiers, four or 5,000 soldiers times three meals a day. <laughs> I don't think those restaurants could take the, the amount of food. I don't think they could take the amount of soldiers. It was amazing logistics. That's right. Gentlemen, he wins the war. Tribes from all different parts of the country are uh, coming to Gidon. We want you to be our Moshel. We want you to be our governor. What does he say? Not that he plays hard to get. He says, Hashem yimloch alechem. Gidon has a mistaken approach to the leadership of the Jewish people, okay? He thinks that uh, there should only be divine control over the Jewish people, okay? He didn't learn Mechon Mir. He didn't learn Merkaz Aravko. He has not learned the section of the kingdom in the book of Devarim. And some of you know the Rambam. He opens up in his Mishnah Torah in the laws of Hilchot Beit Bechira, chapter one, uh, law number one. Three mitzvot are the Jewish people uh, imposed upon them to perform when they come into the land of Israel. Number one, can what but right to wipe out to establish a king to wipe out the seed of Amalek. What is the third mitzvah? And build a place for the Beit Hamikdash. That's what the Rambam holds based upon Gemarot in Sanhedrin, and that's how he codified the law. Gidon, no. He refuses. It's a fact he does and won't accept what the people want. Is that right or not? We know it's not right. We know that's one of the reasons why the section of chapter 8 was written over here. Now, this ideal that he had for divine control fell after his death. He thought, I have to remind the people that there has to be national control over the land of Israel. He orders to make from a lot of gold contributions, this ephod, the special uh, woven uh, memory cloth that should be presented, maybe with a statue in the middle of town. People come to visit it, but after his death, people bow down to it. They turn it into Avodah Zarah. As a result, as we saw at the end of the last chapter, Gidon has 70 sons. He had many wives that also would probably not allow him to become king. As the Torah says in the book of Devarim, lo yaber lo nashim, lo There are several prerequisites that a king must have. He cannot have too much money, too many wives, and so on and so forth. Therefore, Gidon wouldn't be the ideal king. But had he accepted and done tshuva, there's so that, it may have been a different situation. But we're going to learn now that the anti-monarchy leanings of Gidon led to a very suppressive situation. A tyrant comes in, okay? There happens to be a political vacuum. How does it happen? Gidon has 70 sons, plus he has one son from a Pilagesh, as we learned in the end of the chapter, a woman that has no ktuba, no contractual obligations to. And after this situation, Gidon checks out the situation. Let's start reading now, Perek Tet. Notice to who does he go to get support? The brothers of his mother, the Pilegesh. Okay? He speaks to them. Apparently what's happening, as we're going to read the next Pasuk, there's a 70-member parliament ruling in the area at least. And these are the 70 sons. 
Remember, they wanted Gidon to rule or and afterwards his sons. So maybe it could be that these convened together, these 70 sons from his many wives, and they're ruling at least over the Menashe area or the area adjacent to the city of Shechem. And he calls his family, Pasuk Bet, Abruna Biozne, Kol Bale Shechem, speak to the VIPs in Shechem. Okay? Matov Lechem. What do you prefer? Number one, Hamishol Bechem Shivimish, right? It's based upon this. Do you want these 70 guys to rule over you? Kol Bene Yerubal. Remember, Gidon was given a nickname, Yerubal, Yariv Abal. He was the counterpart, he was the answer to the idolatry that has permeated Jewish life in the land of Israel so much. And in his backyard of his father, in the town of Ofra, he destroyed the Canaanite, the Baal idolatry in his father's backyard. That eventually led to a spiritual wake up. People went behind him, supported him. He gathered thousands together and God said, no, I'm going to prove to the nation that I'm the power behind the Jewish people. And Gidon with 300 people won the war. Mijan escapes the coup. They leave Gidon and his fellow soldiers kill the two major uh, generals, kill the two major kings. And Israel's on a big upswing. Now is the time for the national identity, the national memory of God to be uplifted. It's an ideal time, but Gidon says, no, I don't want a king. Interesting, and I'm going to ask you, why did he call his son Avimelech? What did Gidon mean? And what does Avimelech understand? Apparently, what did Gidon, what do you think Gidon meant when he called this son? Right, my father's the king. We don't need a king. Avi is the Melech. We don't need the king. But the son, as we're going to read, who wants to assert power, wants to take over. Uh, what is he going to think? What, what is the meaning of his name? What? His father My father was a king and I'm going to continue the kingdom. So he presents the question to the people in Shechem. Do you want these 70 people to rule? Or? 70 people is a balagan, 70 opinions, you know, 70 Jews in one room is 71 opinions at least. That's a balagan. Who needs the balagan until they get them to come together? It's terrible. How would have Gideon taking the throne prevented this? So oh. Just allowed Abimar to get the throne. Gideon, as we're going to read, was, was becoming close to God. He fought with the name of God. Cherev la Hashem Gideon. That was the susma, the password of his word, of, of his war was bringing people closer to Namuna. He himself grew up reform. He happened to be told about Yitzhak Mitzrayim in the Seder we, 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 we reflected upon. And he asked really sharp questions on faith of God. If God really loves us and we're really the Amskula, so why doesn't he save us now even though we're empty and void of Mitzvot? He started to ask very good questions. That's why God thought he would be the ideal candidate to be a shofet, a leader. Avimelech doesn't have the values of Gidon, as we're about to see. Let's read about his cruelty. Let's read about how, how cruel he is. Let's read. So, Uzchartem, you'll be able to remember, if I'm the leader, Ki atzmechem uvisarchem ani. I'm from you. I'm, I'm one of you guys. I come from this area. Who makes the decision? Pasu Gimel. Vayidabru imo alav. Remember, it's his mother's family. We call this nepotism. They're speaking, they're, they're, they're getting on the soapbox, they're debating, yes, no, should we or should we not? And notice what determines the decision in the middle of verse 3. Vayet libam, here in Shoftim chapter 9, Vayet libam acharei avimelech, ki amru hachinuhu. What is making the decision? Vayet libam. The lave, the emotional side, is determining the decision and not the seichel, exactly. Okay? The fact that he is mishpacha, then that's why we want him to be what? The leader. Now, I want you to know, there are those that explain. Some of the people now in Shechem, do you understand that they could be the lineage of the lineage of the lineage of Hamor ben Shechem, 
who is a Canaanite. And ever since the act of revenge done by Shimon and Levi and his brothers to the raping of their sister Dina, they've been very good with the Jewish people. I don't know if you remember, but Shechem, according to the Gemara Mesechet Sota, was the first place we went into after we put down our Samsonite luggage. What's the name of that place? Where we did the massive Gil, you know, in Gilgal, right? I know you're going to get to an archaeological point of view in a moment. Once we put our things down in Gilgal, we marched to the city of Shechem, Har Grizim in the south, Har Eval in the north. The city itself is in the valley. And what did we do there? Zolta. The tekes of the brachot and the klalot, the sacrifices of Yeshua, right? Which, what, I forgot the name of that great uh, archaeologist that found the uh, altar of Yeshua. What's his name? Forgot his name. Yeah, I forgot his name. In any event, maybe we'll do that on a trip with Gershon. We'll do a Shomron trip, whatever, and only unfortunately see the Har, uh, Har Eval from Har Kabir, which is just opposite it in Elon Mora. But Shechem, how did we go into the city of Shechem to do this blessings and curses, reacceptance of Torah at Sinai, and the Canaanites are living there? How did that happen? So one of my rabbis, Raveli Mali, who's Rosh Hashiva in, uh, in, uh, in Yafo, he says, ever since that act happened hundreds of years earlier, they've been very quiet. They've been very acceptance of the Jewish people. They allowed the Jewish people just to come in and do the brachot to klalot. In any event, it could very well be that here in the area of Shechem, they are treaty members, Canaanites, living there quietly, are treaty members of the Jewish people. And now he's relating to these treaty members and asking them, what do you prefer? Do you want these 70 brothers of mine to be your parliament over you? Or do you want the leadership of one person like me? And they're deciding this. Not only they're deciding they want Avimela, Pasuk Dalid, Vayinulo Shivim Kesef. Let's pay taxes. Mi Beit Baal Brit. Now this term is a loaded term. Beit Baal Brit. Beit Baal Brit apparently is an idolatry matter. Beit Baal. Baal is the Canaanite entity called Baal. And the leaders of the Brit with the Jewish people, they're paying, not lip service, they're paying support money to Achimelech. To Achimelech. Avimelech, thank you. They're paying that. And now, what does Avi Melech do with his money? And this tells you what type of person he is. If you wanted to say that he has the leadership qualities of his father, let's see just uh, what his values are. It's not it's absolutely, we see that he's a leader. Who does he take to, who does he hire? Notice, Anashim Rikim Ufochazim, low life people, empty of values. Okay, the low life people. Now, why do low life people go after Avimelech? Why does he attract them? What? Oh, okay, so he's giving them, they were on unemployment. Right, so they're getting more money. What else? Maybe they share values with Avimelech. Low life people. Very low value type of people. Tell me your friends, I'll tell you who you are. Yeah, exactly. These are his friends. These are his cohorts. That tells you what type of person he is. What does he do by virtue of getting this support? He's all well planned out. He leaves Shechem, travels to Ofra, Pasuk 5. Vayavo Beit Aviv Ofrata. Vayarog et Achav, B'nei Yerubal, Shivim Ish Alev Enechat. Vayivater Yotam Ben Yerubal, Akaton Ki Nechba. 70 brothers from the same father, not the same mothers. He wipes them out one day in Ofra. We see how brutal this guy is. One brother does survive. One brother, Yotam, survives. But what is this coming to teach us? Why is this happening? What does the Tanakh want to tell us here? Now, let's go back to Gidon. He had this utopian vision that man 
the men of Israel don't have to rule over themselves. Hashem yimloch leolam let God rule over us. We don't need men to rule over us. Okay? Now, in order for that to happen, we have to be not mild-mannered people. We have to be on such a high ruchani level that we're all so good, so beneficial to one another, uh, doing chesed, being a tzaddikim, helping out the klal. But that's not the situation. Situation here is, hey, Gido knew that we're not an instrument, that he's not an instrument of perfection. The nation on this level is not an instrument of perfection. And Gidon doesn't bring Malchut Hashem to the world. What does it cause? A desecration of God's name. Cause the desecration of God's name. It's the destruction of the house of Gidon. His name is going to smithereens right now. Gidon. How would him taking the crown prevent this? Okay. Gidon had the ability right now to set up something that the Jewish people have been waiting for hundreds of years. Ever since Yoshua bin Nun. When he finished his job of 14 years, seven of going to war, seven of allocating the land, Yoshua, though Melech is not stated by him, neither is it stated by Moshe Rabbeinu, but Chazal saw both of them as a pseudo king. The support of the nation led by God to them, like a pseudo king. Right now, Am Yisrael is divided. We're living in tribal division. We can't get an act together. If we have a federation, something which will be one national rule, like a king, like we've been studying, Ilchot Melachim of the Rambam, based upon Parshat Milucha in the book of uh, Devarim, in chapter in Parshat Shoftim. We've been waiting for this. And all of a sudden, this guy by power, okay, look, he's called the king in the rest of the chapter. Look at, read the next Pasuk. Pasuk 6 Vayesfu ko balei shechem vecho Beit Milo Beit Milo seems to be a town adjacent to the city of Shechem Okay Vayelchu vayamlichu et Avimelech For the first time in the Tanakh We have the concept Vayamlichu He is now crowned as king Imelon mutzav asher b'shechem Avimelech now turns to be the first king in the Mikra, in the Tanakh. Okay? And all this is the emotional understanding of his wife's, I'm sorry, of his mother's family. Remember, to answer your question, if we were to, to chart right now a graph, a chart of the period of the Shoftim, which lasts more than 300 years, we have... Aliot and Yuridot. Aliot and Nephilot. Ups and downs, ups and downs throughout hundreds of years. A very long time. Shiabud, we're subjected. Yeshua, salvation. We're wiped out. Then there's a revival. This entire wild situation has been going on for hundreds of years. What do you think has been in the hearts of the Jewish people in every generation? What are they waiting for? What are they looking for? Give us one leader that will unite the nation. When will we have this Gu'ula here already in Eretz Yisrael? We're sick and tired of either Amalek ruling over us, Mo Melech Moab ruling over us, Mijan ruling over us, the Plishtim ruling over us, and so on and so forth. So much hope was put at Gidon. We never saw this before in the, in the, in the Sefer. You be our leader, Mishol Aleinu. That's so much hope in Gidon. And from you to your children. And what do we learn out? Here comes, there's a political vacuum. Avimelech walks into this political vacuum and he takes advantage. His mother's a Pilagesh. She's not something of outstanding quality apparently. Not probably special Midot or so on and so forth. And... Uh, the Arbar Benel says here, Rav uh, Bin Nun, the Sefer in front of me right now, the Rav of Shiloh, says, Gidon called his son Avimelech because he didn't want a human king. No Jewish king. Avimelech. Okay? Gidon certainly had CPO anticipations of something happening. However, now Avimelech is, is 
Some say that now Avimelech maybe called himself, okay, after the death of his father, I am, I am the what? The Avi Amalchut. I'm the what? I'm the father of, I'm the first of all kings of Israel. That's how Professor uh, Elit Tzor, uh, in one of his works here, is, is quoted here. In other words, Avimelech sees himself, I'm the one that's going to make a turnaround in the nation of Israel. Now, before I go further, you had a question, uh, Matanya? It was, it was the, the Chazal, or what are you implying here? Say that it's a mistake that you don't accept the kingship? Oh, absolutely. Let's read uh, what Chazal say right now in source number one, the Midrash Tanchuma, on the work page that you have in front of you. We have a Midrash Tanchuma from Parshad Vayikra. Some of you know from Pirkei Avot, that someone that runs away from authority, what does authority do? It follows you. Very good. I'm reading. The one that's fleeing from authority. Authority comes running after him. We see in the Sefer Shmuel in Perakud. Shaul was known to be very humble. Very modest. He was not looking for honor, for authority, to be a ruler. Okay? Did you see who God chose? Okay? Remember, Shaul, out of the commandment of his father, is looking for his father's lost chamor, last mule, the lost mule. Now, do you remember the days when your dad would ask you to throw out the garbage? You know, you turn your nose this way, turn your nose that way. What, you know, walk, you know, 30, 30 meters to throw out the garbage. You would complain. No, ah, but, you know, uh, I'll do it afterwards. Not you, it never happens to you, Thomas. I know you would. Uh, what? Not you, I know, right? No, it's not you. Okay. What does Shaul's father ask him to do? God, look, start looking. What does he do? He travels kilometers all over the country looking for his father's look. What a tremendous kibbutz. Ah. And then... They're about to go back, but his servant said, no, we can't go back. We can't go back with a, maybe we should walk into this town. The visioner, the seer is here. The Roah. Who is the visioner, the seer? Shmuel. Okay. And then he says, I want you to be the king of Israel, right? You're okay. You're okay. You would be the king. Okay. And of course, Sh Sh Mr. Shaul is not at all interested in it. But he's the, he's the most prominent person. He's so righteous. He's so humble. He's so courageous. Okay? So here we see a person running away from authority. Eventually, the authority gets to him. Now, you asked the question. Now let's get an answer. Avimelech ben Yerubal, the Midrash says, Radaf achare asrara. He was running after authority. Hav asrara barchami menu. Okay? It, that we're going to learn how it's going to leave Avimelech. He won't be able to hold on to him. Because what kind of srara is based on haragam kulam eleven achat umalach al balei shchem ulebasof in the end vayishlach elokim ruach rabin balei shchem uven avi melach vargao toisha. In the end, he's killed by a woman. The ruach of Hashem becomes ruach ra'a. He, his determination to be a leader over everyone, God foils this attempt, doesn't allow him to last longer. Why? Because he's not fit. He doesn't have the midot, he doesn't have the ability, and therefore, one of the main reasons this chapter is brought here, we have to learn who is the right person to become melech. What kind of midot does he have to have? What kind of nefesh must he have? And therefore, we're going to learn about this matter. It's clear that because of the political vacuum, he looked for power, kills 70 people. He murders. He's a murderer. He's a mass murderer. That's not a person that can become a king of Israel to kill your own brothers, your own blood, your own fellow man. Yes, go ahead.
by this principle applied to Shell, why didn't it occur with Gidon? He was righteous and he said no. Gidon is, Gidon is mistaken. Gidon didn't learn in the yeshiva that you're learning. Gidon is way before the time of Shaul. He didn't learn. He didn't know. He doesn't know better. He has a false concept for what leadership is about, without a doubt. It's a total mistake. Both Shaul and are refusing to take leadership. But, but Shaul accepted. He had no choice. Shmuel anointed and poured the anointing oil over his head. He, he became king. He had no choice. And he led Israel to war. He wasn't the best king. He saw that, you know, he didn't really want it. When he was anointed, you know what he went back? He went back to his own farming. As you read there in Sefer, he went back to do his own farming. A king doesn't have to do farming. Yes? Two things. First, if you take an example from the Quran, Yonah runs away from Flurry, but then it finds it. There's that authority. There is a mission as a Navi. There, Yonah received the mission to go warn the nations of the world in Mesopotamia, in the area of uh, uh, Iraq, Assyria, Assyria, Turkey of today, whatever. Ashur, the Assyrian area, Ashur, to uh, do tshuva, otherwise doom day is going to come to them. He was afraid. He knows that the goyim out of fear will do tshuva if they, if they see that doomsday is about to come to them. And that's not going to look good for the Jewish people. Okay, in the front page of the Jerusalem Post, the goyim are doing tshuva, the Jewish people are, are you know, baking in the LA sun and, and, and not doing tshuva and this and that. That's what they're doing, right? He was afraid of that. So therefore he tried to avoid it. He has so much mysterious nefesh for the Jewish people that he's willing to give up his life. Because you know that if you get a mission to do prophecy, you're not allowed to be borech. You're not allowed to flee or escape the prophecy. He says, I can't. I can't go ahead. I can't make the Jewish people look so bad. In other words, he uses mysterious nefesh to save the Jewish people. Of course, he's going to pay for it. Meaning he was always made, almost kefilt fish was made out of him, as you know. Right? You understand the joke? Okay, just say that. You don't like that one, do you? You like that one? It's not mine. It's Rabbi Avinir said that joke. Rav Shlomo Avinir. Yes. I still don't understand why he's... Like, that's, Hashem, Hashem spoke to him, or angels spoke to him, to Gidon in the past. If, that, if they wanted him to be a king, why didn't they just appear to him and tell him to be a king? I can see so Gidon say, well, Hashem appeared to me and told me what to do when I had to fight these people, so why isn't that I'm supposed to be king? Hashem doesn't appear to me. Very good question. Our... No, they approached him, they wanted him to be king, and he didn't want to take it. Well, they told him in Dvarim. It's like, why didn't he come? Why didn't Hashem come to Gideon and say, keep Shabbat? Because he already told you. Ah, okay. Well, let, let, me, let, me blend, let me blend the two together. Hashem is not going to interfere too much in our lives. Not in our national lives, not in our personal lives. On the one hand, the national lives, uh, we have to mature. We have to mature as a nation. It's going to take 400 years for the nation of Israel to have a king, to have one federal leadership over them. And we're going through the ups and downs and ups and downs. We had hoped, there's hope, national hope, that Gideon would take it. God's not going to force the situation. We don't want it. He's not going to shove it down our throat. He's going to let us make the choice. And that's what's happening here. He, 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 there, he, it was led up to a situation where maybe God gave us the victory over three, over, over thousands, tens of thousands of soldiers, maybe to lead to a national kingdom. But he's not going to force it upon us. If Gideon wants to make this mistake, he's going to let them make a mistake. How did Chazal say? If Gideon wants to go in this negative path, God's going to allow, allow him to get, go in a negative path. God allows us to make the decisions, without a doubt. Um, so here we see that the situation is terrible. And I want to share with you regarding this Baal Brit situation. Uh, there's a, a Baal Brit. I think in Chazal they talk about a Zvuv. As if they bow down to a fly or something. Something low level uh, a matter here. Why, why do we need in the Midrash of Chazal to tell us that they bow down even to flies? We're reaching now, we're bottoming out right now. The nation is bottoming out. The fact that Gideon didn't accept the kingdom, here comes a, a cruel person, goes in there, accepts a treaty with non-Jewish entities like Canaanites, like Baal, and they're paying their way to support Avimelech. That is a chilul Hashem. That's a terrible thing happening here. He goes all the way to Ofrah, 
where his father used to live. His father was a national hero. His father had a, a square named after him, a, a coat, an aphod in his name made out of gold and other things. That turned into a terrible thing where people are doing idolatry there. He, he knows that he, ha how will he remain to be a leader? Only if these 70 people are, are, are out of here. That's cruelty, 70 people to kill. So right now the Jewish people were on the lowest. But don't think that he is only cruel. Our leaders often mirror the national situation. Our situation is bad. We, ha we had an up, we went over the Midianites, but after Gidon's death, the barometer is negative. The spirit of the nation is depressing. The, the, the morals of the Jewish people were back at it. Idolatry. Gentlemen, we're not a bunch of fools. We have the highest capabilities that God gave us. If we channel it to good things, we're, doing, we're, we're on the go. If we channel it to terrible things, there's no greater sinners than the Jewish people. We're the best. We're better than the Chicago Mafia, right? You heard about the Chicago Mafia? Sure. What? I don't know what you're talking about, but... Uh, what? In any event, as the Maral of Prague explains, the abilities that God gave the Jewish people can be used positively, negatively. Here, they're used negatively. A terrible thing. I want to... Uh, Look what's stated here regarding Avimelech in the second source in the Midrash. This time we're quoting a Yalkut Shimoni. Some of you know from Mishle, the Pasuk, Zeshamar Katuv Tov Shachin Karov Meach Rachok. Have you heard that Pasuk before? Who's better? A close neighbor more than a? A distant brother. What is it talking about? Follow the reading if you can in Hebrew. Tov Yitro Shaya Rachok Yitro, what a great character. He came from so far, right? And he became close to me, to Moshe Rabbeinu, in the Gula of the Jewish people. When Moshe Rabbeinu shared the great events of Yitziat Mitzrayim, Kriyat Yamsuf, all the great events happening to the Jewish people, he was so happy. So greater is Yitro, who we call right now Shachen Karov, He's now a new neighbor. He came from Mijan. More than who? Middle of the second line of this paragraph. Me Esav Arasha. Esav. I'm sorry. Esav Arasha. Shayach. The brother of? Yaakov. However, why is he distant? Vinit He chose a different path of life. And God gave him the Edomite mountains. The Esavian mountains, right? As we go down to the Arava. On southeastern Israel. As we read the book of Ovadia and others, we learn about how cruel, how happy he is when we, when trouble is happening to the Jewish people. Esav or the Esavian people are being reprimanded by the prophet. Don't be happy on the bad days of the Jewish people, of the Judean people and somewhere else. That's one meaning. Devar acher, another meaning. Tova ya avi melech. Melech plishtim. Now we're talking about a different avi melech. Do you remember him in the book of Breshit? The king of. Who came in contact with him? Why? For, so first of all, when we had a Rav Ba'aret, Avram Avinu starts going down south. Right? And... He has to encounter the Plishtim people. Apparently there is food there in south, not far from where we were on a trip yesterday, southwestern Eretz Yisrael. And Avimelech, or his officers, see a beautiful woman in Sarai, or Sarai rather, and she's taken by force. And then when Avimelech wants to do better, God appears through angels and so on and so forth. So the Midrash says, Tova ya Avimelech, he was a good guy. How? Melech plished him. Shir kavod l'avram. After Avimelech is surprised, and after he and his household are plagued, 
Avimelech knows that he's playing with fire by trying to take Sarah and do bad things with her. And then Avimelech offers a lot of material benefit to Avram to the extension, Emar, Hine, Artsi Lefanecha, my land is your land. Take whatever you want, whatever material possessions take. So the Midrash says, wow, I know he's doing it because he wants. He's sorry what he did. He's messing with God. But he offers anything and everything in his own land. He is better than who? May Avimelech ben Yerubal. Shara get the chav. Avimelech that killed his brothers? Amar lo kadosh baruch hu. Avimelech rasha. You're a wicked guy. Ata arak te shivim mishalev en achat. Afatav atashlech isha achat pelach. We'll learn later at the end of the chapter. Uh, the end of the matter. That a woman throws down one of the millstones and his head is crushed this way, which is like a midah, can I get midah? He with like on one stone killed all the 70 people. So we see terrible things happening to this person. Gentlemen, it's clear to us that Avimelech is a wild person and he's plotting here. He's exploiting this empty, this vacuum of political ruling. And who's at fault? It's no doubt that the Tanakh sees Gidon as the person responsible. Did Gidon leave instructions who should rule? No. Did his 70 sons take the ruling? Yes. Now all of this is happening in a central area, the city of Shechem. Don't think that this is randomly happening. The city of Shechem has proved to be in the Tanakh a very central area, and let's prove it. The fact that he's becoming king, you're saying, well, why doesn't he become king in Yerushalayim? Why doesn't he become king in Betel? Okay, so one answer is Yerushalayim is not yet in our hands. It'll still take another 100 or 200 years for us to defeat the plishtim that are ruling over that area. Okay? And that'll be done by David's time. What happened in Shechem that we see it as a central area? Can we trace places in the city of Shechem, gentlemen? Yeah, it's uh, the first place. Okay. The that, uh, okay, so let's go back first. If we go according to chronological order, when God says to Avram Avinu, Lech Lecha, and he's on the other side of the Euphrates, and Avram arrives, 75 years old, not on a Negat Express bus, but on the donkey walking, probably had some blisters and you know where, sitting on a donkey for a few weeks. Not easy. You think it's easy, huh? No, right? So uh, he arrives and he comes to Elon Morel, overlooking Shem. And there God appears to him, reveals himself, acquire. It says, Vayera Elav Hashem. God uh, reveals himself to that place. That's one place. Next. What else do we see Shechem? The case of Yaakov, of, of the brothers, uh, the brothers and sister Dina. In other words, the thing is, Rav Shimshon and Fal Hirsch explains, there's a sense of brotherhood, a sense of achva, fraternity amongst the brothers. They can't go forward and continue living when they see that their sister was raped. Now remember, what led to that area? How did Yaakov arrive to that area? Same towns that we mentioned learning here, interestingly enough. Masei Avot Siman Labanim. And then he comes into Shechem. What does he buy? What does he buy? No. A field. For Meaksita. What is he interested in?